In this video, I want to talk about process diagrams and give you an introduction to mass balances. In previous videos, I've gone over this conceptually. Now, I want to be more quantitative and show you how you would actually apply these concepts to engineering problems. First, I want to show you an image of a wastewater treatment plant. What can you see in this photo? Uh, what information does it contain? Uh, what information is it lacking? Can you describe the process given what you can see in this photograph? You may notice the types and locations of different reactors uh, in this wastewater treatment plant pictured in the photo. I know you may not know much about wastewater treatment at this point, but what you see here is a fairly typical wastewater treatment plant. However, in the photo, you can't really see how water flows through the plant. Um, where does it enter? Uh, where does it exit? Uh, what order does it flow through the reactors? Uh, you don't really know what chemicals are used. Uh, we know that wastewater treatment uh, produces sludge, but it's not immediately uh, visible in this photo where, it, where it, what happens to that sludge, where it goes. Um, you may be getting the sense that while this photo is informative, uh, it lacks a lot of information that an engineer would need to know about this particular system. Here's a process diagram uh, or flow chart of the same plant. As you're looking at this diagram, I want you to know what information uh, does this diagram contain that's not in the photograph? What other types of information could you include in this diagram? First, you can see that sewage enters on the left-hand side of the diagram and generally, generally flows towards the right. Um, if you went back and looked at the photograph, you would notice that the layout of the process diagram isn't exactly the same as the physical layout of the plant, which is fine. The process diagram has been modified to make it easier to read. Other factors may contribute to the physical locations of the actual um, units in the plant. You can see that water, the blue line, travels through the screens to the primary clarifier, to a bionutrient reactor, a secondary clarifier, and disinfection before leaving the plant. You can also see how sludge travels through the plant, how air is used in the aerobic part of the bioreactor, and how heat is managed. This particular diagram was made for the general public. Um, I, ju I just pulled it off the city website. However, additional information would be included if it was an like a diagram made for engineers. Um, so for example, if the diagram was actually made for engineers, it might include flow rates, uh, composition of liquids and solids moving through the plant, uh, temperatures and other process variables. In fact, you could write a very detailed diagram for each unit. Uh, process in this wastewater treatment plant. So by the end of this video, you should be familiar with the process, different process variables, including mass and volumetric flow rates. Uh, you should understand how to apply something called the continuity equation. You should be able to properly label a process diagram. And you should have some ideas of how to apply the mass balance equation to simple problems. So I'm going to start with process variables. There are several types of process variables, including variables for density, specific volume, which is the inverse of density, temperature, specific gravity, and pressure or head. You have likely covered these types of variables in physics and chemistry courses that you've already had. Um, and you can review them in your textbook. Right now, I want to focus on variables that you haven't seen before or that are a little different in an engineering context. First, I want to talk about flow rate. This is the rate at which a material is transported through a process. You have mass and volumetric flow rates. Mass flow rates have a dimension of mass per unit time which you can also write as M with a dot over it. Volumetric flow rates have a dimension of volume per unit time, and they can be written as V with a dot over it. 
you can use density of a fluid to convert between m dot and b dot. Um, for example, in this equation, m dot equals rho, which is the density times v dot. Uh, you could think of m dot as having units like kilograms per second. Density might have units of kilograms per liter. And v dot could have units of liters per second. When thinking about volumetric flow rates, it's also useful to remember something called the continuity equation. This equation relates the average velocity of the fluid to the volumetric flow rate of the fluid by using the cross-sectional area of the pipe or conduit. So we have V dot equals A times V. Uh, in this equation, V dot is the volumetric flow rate, for example, meters cubed per second. A is the cross-sectional area, uh, for example, in meters squared. And V is the average velocity of the fluid, let's say in meters per second. So if you're given the dimensions of a pipe and the average velocity of the fluid through a pipe, then you can calculate the volumetric flow rate using this continuity equation. Another type of process variable that you may not have seen before is something called gauge pressure. Most of the chemistry equations that you've probably seen in your chemistry class uh, use a pressure term that is the absolute pressure. In engineering, you often see gauge pressure, which is the difference between absolute pressure and atmospheric pressure, where P absolute equals P gauge plus P atmosphere. Um, you might also see a unit PSIA, which means pounds per square inch of absolute pressure, or PSIG, which means pounds per square inch of gauge pressure. So, you're reading an engineering problem and you see all of this information on inputs, outputs, process conditions. What do you do with them? You're going to want to draw a process diagram. This is going to help you formulate your plan for how to solve the problem. Felder and Rousseau lay out a straightforward process for making and labeling process diagrams and I would encourage you to follow it every single time you need to draw a process diagram. So. The first step is going to be to draw your system. Remember, we're engineers, we're not artists necessarily. You don't need to draw amazing, beautiful process diagrams. Use simple boxes or circles for each of your units or your unit processes. And then use arrows to represent inputs and outputs. Um, you're going to want to write values with units for each known variable at the location of the streams on the chart. So you'll, you'll write down what you know um, and put it in the right spot on your chart. And then there are many things that you don't know. So often a problem will ask you one or multiple things about your system uh, that you have to find out. So for those variables, what you're going to want to do is assign algebraic symbols um, to those unknown um, variables in the streams. And um, for those unknown symbols, you're going to want to write that variable name and also indicate what units you want to use it in. Uh, in general, there's a convention for different types of units. So for mass, we always use m. For mass flow rate, we always use m dot. Uh, volume is always v, and volumetric flow rates are always v dot. Um, if you want to do a mass or mole fraction in a liquid, you use an x. And if you want to do a mass or a mole fraction in a gas, you use a Y. And so you do all of that, and then you're going to go back and check. So for each stream in your system, so for each input and each output, you're going to want to make sure that you show the following. So you're going to want either the overall mass or volumetric flow rate for that stream and a breakdown of the stream composition or you're going to want to show a flow rate for each constituent in that stream. So you need either one of those. So this seems like a lot of like kind of like weird rules for drawing process diagrams, um, especially if this is something you've kind of been doing willy-nilly for a while. Um, but it's really important because if you have a properly labeled process diagram, um, you can carry out a successful degree of freedom analysis for your problem. So this is basically when you go through your flow chart, you identify all of your unknowns, and you need to write independent equations to solve each of your unknown variables. For every unknown, you need 
one independent equation. So remember, you, your number of unknowns should always equal your number of equations. Um, so if you have more variables than equations, or more unknowns than equations, um, then your problem is underdefined. So no matter what you do, no matter how long you spend trying to do the math on this problem, you're not going to be able to solve it. So you need to go back and find more information before you try. So remember, number of no unknowns should equal the number of equations. Um, if you happen to have more equations than you have variables, your problem is overdefined, and solving it may be pretty difficult. So really what you want to always remember is to properly label your process diagram, make sure you have all of the unknowns that you need to have in there, and then you need the right number of equations. So you need one equation for every unknown. So all of this leads to really like one of the main topics of this class, which is mass balance. So this is a way to mathematically analyze systems. We have a general mass balance equation, which is accumulation equals inputs minus outputs plus generation minus consumption. So if we wanted to be a little more mathematical, we could write that with m's for mass. So our mass accumulated equals our mass inputs minus our mass outputs plus our mass generated minus our mass consumed. Or we can use mass flow rates, which is indicated here by the dots above. So either one of those, um, you, you would choose if you want to do masses or mass flow rates, depending on the problem you want to solve. So let's break this down. So accumulation is a term that describes the accumulation of mass within your system. So you can have positive accumulation, where this m, m accumulation terms is greater than zero, or you could have negative accumulation, um, where it's, it's less than zero. Um, if you think about an example of a bank account, positive accumulation term would mean that you're saving money. A negative accumulation term means that you're losing money. So um, if we can make a steady state assumption for our system, uh, then you're, you can say that your accumulation term is zero because the mass within the system isn't changing with time. So if you were to think about your bank account, this may be true if you always have the same amount of money in your bank account. So inputs and outputs deal with the input of mass into your system or the output of mass um, from your system. If you're looking at a bank account example, input could be money um, from a summer job, while outputs could include money uh, that you have to spend for tuition, rent, utilities, or food. Um, finally, the generation and consumption term in um, these mass balance problems most often deal with some sort of chemical reaction that either generates or consumes the, um, the mass in your system. In our bank account example, um, maybe you have an account that pays some interest. Um, so that would be like a generation term. Finally, you may be wondering, when can I apply this mass balance equation? So you can do a mass balance on any material in a system or any unit process. You can apply it to the total mass in your system, um, or you can apply it to any molecular or atomic species. For a given problem, it's likely that you're going to be doing, able to do several different mass balance equations. So this is quite a bit for one video. Um, after watching this video, you should now be uh, familiar with different process variables, including mass and volumetric flow rates. Remember what gauge pressure is, right? So it's the difference between uh, your, your total pressure, or your, your absolute pressure, and your atmospheric pressure. Uh, you should understand how to apply that continuity equation, so that if you're given the velocity of a fluid, you can find the flow rate. And you should be able to use these rules now to draw and properly label your process diagram so that you can do a good degree of freedom analysis. And we've kind of given you like a brief introduction for um, how to apply the mass balance equation in simple problems. In the next video, I'm going to take this information and apply it 
um, to a pretty common type of engineering problem.